Most people don't realize the race is almost over by the time that starting light turns green. It's about consistency and preparation. The decisions we're committed to. The motivation to do the necessary maintenance. That's what keeps the engine running. Without real intention, it's easy to be left in the dust. It's discipline. Day in, day out that nobody sees. That's where the race is won. So before the race begins, the fans pile in to watch that car rocket to the finish line. And I'm telling you what, you don't have to be a drag race junkie or even a race car fan to appreciate the beauty of that sight of watching raw power turned into propulsion of like rocketing down to the finish line. And... Uh, you, you got to know that this image of a race car is really inspiring to us. I mean, you don't have to be a drag car fan to realize, like, I want that to be my life. I want to I see power in my life that God has invited me to experience, transferred into movement. Like, I want to go where God is leading me, and I want to finish well and be able to look at God at the end of life and hear those words, well done. And so every week in this series, we've been asking ourselves, all right, what's it look like to fire on all cylinders? What does it look like to be a high-performance life racing machine? Well, this week, we're going we're gonna to talk about one of those aspects behind the scene because, as you well know, much of the race is determined outside the race track. Let's talk about the engines. When it comes to the engine, there is so much heat because of the explosions, pressure, torque that is created in those engines that they have to be refreshed, meaning the mechanics like tear them all apart and refresh them, build them back. At the highest end of drag car racing, the top fuelers, they do this between every race. Like they rip the sucker apart and put it all the way back together. And you and I would have watched that car perform and we would have thought, really? What are you doing ripping that thing apart? Here's what they know. If they continue to allow that engine to perform without refreshing it, the power, the performance decreases. I mean, my, my favorite part of the race is the burnout. Like when you see that power transferred to those wheels and whoo, I mean, you have that rumble, the takeoff, it's like, oh, <laughs> that is awesome. Like I want to be in on that kind of burnout. But let's be straight. The kind of burnout that most of us are experiencing is more like what happens to an engine when it never gets refreshed. It just keeps losing power. So what we're going to talk about today is how is God inviting us through Jesus to be refreshed in such a way that we have that kind of burnout, not the burnout of losing the power that he has given to us through Jesus. So to get started, 
I want you to look at the person sitting closest to you, look them in the eye and tell them, I think I know what kind of burnout you got. Go ahead, go ahead. You all are having way too much fun with that, so <laughs> need to find a new source of entertainment or something. I don't know. Okay, so here we go. If you got your Bible or your Bible app, let's go to Matthew chapter 11. We're just going to look at the last three verses there and make our way into chapter 12. So we're right in the middle of Jesus' teaching. Let me give you a little bit of context. Matthew being the first book of the New Testament, the first of the four Gospels, the story of Jesus being told. And here's what people are noticing. Jesus teaches differently. Like there's something in his teaching that is far and away different from all the religious teachers of his day. And the one group that Jesus is really ticking off are the religious leaders of his day. Because what we're going to find is that he did not follow all their rules. And because of that, we see some real tension beginning to happen between these religious leaders and the one who has come to offer God's people life. And you, I mean, you don't have to be a Bible expert to hear the life that Jesus is offering. So look in verse 28, again the last few verses of chapter 11, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Like, all of us are like, whew, like, that's me, that's me. I mean, just the beginning of August, we did that series talking about anxiety. Like one out of three of us have been diagnosed. Two out of three of our college students report being overwhelmed with anxiety. And all of us have those times in our lives where the joy is stolen because we are overwhelmed, anxious, burdened down. And Jesus says to folks like us, come to me and I'm going to give you rest. But let me warn you, when, when people hear Jesus say, hey, come to me, I will give you rest, um, a lot of us jump to end of life, like, okay, before I die, I need to make things right with God, and yeah, I'll believe in Jesus, or I'll do that religion thing later. But as we quickly see, Jesus is not inviting us to do something after we die. He's inviting us into something really special today. So let's keep going. He says in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke, man, he said that twice, is easy and my burden is light. Now, yoke is not a word we use very often. You probably know it to be a very simple apparatus whereby two beasts of burden, so think a pair of oxen, are tied together to pull a load. So a heavy cart or a plow through a field. It's like we kind of know what that ancient tool was. We just don't talk about that very much. So he says, take my yoke. But back in Bible days, not only did it refer to how they hooked an ox to another ox, it also referred to the way of following a rabbi. Now here's, here's what they mean. A rabbi's yoke is what it was like to follow him. Like, what would it look like to follow Jesus? So Jesus says, if, when you follow me, like the way I teach, you will find that the burden is light. You will find that there is rest. Come follow me and experience life today. Jesus is not saying, hey, make sure you get things right with God before you die. He is not saying, hey, you better check me out before you croak. He's not saying that. He's saying, hey, let's get this thing started today. And the more we find from Jesus' teaching, he's talking about eternal life that begins now and extends into eternity. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Jesus lays this out and says, hey, following me is beautiful, peaceful, restful. And the very next verses, Matthew captures this um, kind of a glimpse of what it looked like following Jesus. So this, this gets really interesting and illustrative. So chapter 12, verse 1, we find that Jesus is walking through the grain field. So kind of like you see on the screen, think uh, a wheat field. Jesus is walking through the grain fields and it happens to be Saturday, they called it the Sabbath. So a Sabbath was both a day of the week, Saturday, and it was their day of worship. So Jesus is walking through the grain fields on a Saturday, and his disciples are following him. 
Now, as the boys follow him through the field, we find that the boys are hungry. Now, when Scripture says the disciples were hungry, it was more than, um, okay, let me confess the sins of my children. Um, when, when my kids, especially my little ones, get home from school, guess what they say? We are hungry. We're starving. They want another meal between the three meals they already get, right? So when we say we're hungry, mm-mm, mm-mm. No, the boys were hungry. Like, this is back in the day you didn't get three meals a day kind of thing. So when it says they were hungry, like, they needed to be fed. And God had made a provision for hungry people. He tells the harvesters in his law, hey, when you, when you harvest a field, leave the corners there. Because there are people who are in need. There are people who are legitimately hungry. Like, don't harvest it all so people can come along and have a meal. That's just part of being faithful to me. So the disciples were taking God up on his provision, and they were grabbing hold of heads of grain. They were then taking them and rubbing them real hard in their hands, blowing away the chaff, and eating the wheat, eating the grain as they walked by. As all of this is transpiring, the Pharisees, like these are the religious teachers, these are the people that aren't happy with what Jesus is saying about following him. And they look at what the disciples are doing and they're like, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, you're breaking the law. Now here's, here's what's really important. When people in Jesus' day saw a Pharisee or heard a Pharisee's teaching, this is the soundtrack that was going on in their minds. Because they were convinced that to hear from a Pharisee was to hear from God. They're absolutely convinced. But the more you read Scripture, the more you discover that God is um, telling us that there ought to be another soundtrack running in your mind. There is a really sharp warning that when a Pharisee starts talking, look for danger. So the Pharisees say, Jesus, you said to follow you is to find rest. Don't you think your boys ought to be resting on the day of resting? Here's what they had done. They looked at what the disciples were doing. And they were convinced that the disciples had four violations of Sabbath law. They reaped, they threshed, they winnowed, and they prepared a meal. I say, what? Where did they get get that? Well, one, it's solidly in God's word. So we're talking about number four of the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. Which says, in Exodus chapter 20, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. And so what Bible teachers had done over the years was they answered the question, what does it mean to rest, or more importantly, what does it mean to work so I know that these are the things I can't do so that I'm resting on the seventh day of rest? The problem is the Pharisees were creating rules around the rule of God to justify themselves before each other. Like, you'll be impressed with me because I follow all the rules. And to justify themselves before God. Looky at me. Ain't I good? And Jesus was revealing that they had totally missed it. This is how far the Pharisees had taken it. They went through scriptures and found all the examples of work and said, okay, here are the things you can't do. One of those was carrying something that constituted work. So they said, this is their interpretation, you cannot carry anything with your right hand or your left hand across your chest or across your shoulders. All of those constitute work. But, It doesn't count as work if you carry something with the top of your hand, your foot, 
your ear, or your hair. Because those don't count. Now, do you hear what they're doing? They're working really hard to not work. Here's my favorite one. They decided, according to God's word, that it was work to tie a knot. So like if you were thirsty, you could not tie a rope to a bucket and lower it down in a well on the Sabbath. That would be breaking the rules. But there was one provision they had made. A woman could tie her girdle. Makes sense, I guess. So, if you needed water out of a well, all you had to do was have your wife take off her girdle, tie one side of it to the rope, tie the other side of it to the bucket, and then you could lower your wife's girdle into the well, get water, and pull it back up. And that wasn't work. And Jesus is saying, you kind of missed the point. So here's how he describes the point of it all. Look in verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4, he tells a story. He's like, um, haven't you read, which was really offensive to the Pharisees because they were very proud of having read and basically memorized the entire Old Testament. He says, have, have you not read like the story about David? And he, he reminds them of the story of David when he was anointed as king but not yet king. The dude on the throne was still Psycho Saul. And David was a fugitive running for his life. And in one of the times he was running for his life, he stopped by and asked the priest to use the sacred bread to feed he and his men. They were hungry, like legit hungry. And the priest did it. And Jesus says, um, there's nowhere in the Bible that condemns David for doing that. You have never condemned David for doing that. Aren't you kind of missing the point? Then in verse 5, he says, and how about the priest? So you guys are freaking out about my men harvesting on the Sabbath. But, like, the priests work double shifts. Like, the priests work hard on the Sabbath to help people approach God, to offer a sacrifice for the forgiveness of their sins, to be restored in right relationship with God. I mean, haven't, haven't you realized that there are people who rightly work on the Sabbath? Don't you think you missed the point? I mean, here we have these religious leaders who had taken what was a gift from God when God said to his people, hey, there needs to be a special day in your life that's for me, it's for rest. And they had surrounded it with a bunch of rules that had so perverted the original commandment that they were working hard not to work and to justify them before themselves and before God. Jesus said, you guys are totally missing it. Absolutely missing it. Have you noticed how easy it is to laugh at other people's mistakes? Have you noticed how much easier it is to be disgusted with somebody else's sin? That's why Jesus said, hey, like, be concerned about the plank in your eye before you go pulling a splinter out of somebody else's. You see, it's easy for us to say, oh, man, these guys were idiots creating rules around the rules, a bunch of legalism about self-righteousness. Those folks are horrible. And because of that sin, they totally miss the gift of God given to us people. But what if we are too? A little bit different way. But what if we are too? What if we have missed the gift of God for us for rest? Because we don't even know what it is. I would submit to you today that in America, we would describe rest as saving time and an escape. Like that's what we think rest is. We have all kinds of time-saving devices, don't we? I mean, think about the way in which we consume food today. Do you realize that a long, long time ago, people raised and grew their own food? Thank you, Lord, for the microwave and pre-prepared meals. I mean, some of our children would be emaciated and starving if it were not for those meals. And thank you, God, for drive through I mean, that is the divine way to receive food. Or have you read in ancient history how it used to be that people had to actually get up off their couch and physically turn the channel on their TV. I mean, it's been a long time ago, but there was a day. 
And then we so got over that and created a remote control. And more recently, we've so gotten over that, we just tell Alexa or whomever to change the channel for us. I mean, it's like how far we have come. I mean, we are all about saving time. And we're all about escape, too. I mean, let's just be straight. It used to be that um, you would go home and turn on your game console that was connected to your TV to play a game. And now it's in our pocket. If we have 30 seconds available, we escape. And if you got the fancy version, you actually take your phone and put it in a pair of a hood and turn it into virtual reality, and you can just leave this world behind. And then, I mean, like never before, we as Americans vacation. Like never before. And on those vacations, we, we escape on a cruise, an all-inclusive, where we don't have to lift a finger. It all gets done for us. We, we escape. So why is it that no matter your age, why is it that all of us are absolutely convinced that we are busier today than grandma was back in her day? Like, how is that even possible? Columbia School of Business did a study. You know what they say about us? When somebody says, how are you doing? More and more than ever before, we respond with one word. Busy. Used to be good, fine, whatever. You know, now it's busy. Man, I am really busy. How's that possible? With all the time we've saved, with all the ways we can escape... How in the world can we say we're busy? Columbia School of Business says. We do it as what they call a humble brag. Like it looks humble, but really it's bragging. Um, What we've done is we've realized, hey, really important people are busy. And so for me to be perceived as important, I need to say I'm busy. So it's our arrogance. It's our... um, positioning ourselves to look good in the eyes of other people that we claim we're busy, we're really not busy. Now, I mean, it's Columbia School of Business. I'm, who am I to disagree with them? But, but I think there's another piece to it. When, when people tell me they're busy, I don't always or I don't even regularly think, oh, they're, they're trying to make me think they're important, so they just told me I'm busy. No, I like I look in their eyes. I hear about their schedule. They are busy. But what, what if, what if in our desire to discover life, like in our desire to make full use of our lives, what if in our desire to um, kind of feel like we can one day stand before God and have used it all up, what if we keep adding things to our schedule because we think it's important to be busy. What if, like the Pharisees who were trying to position themselves before God with their hard work to not work, all their legalism, what if we are doing that with all of our activity? You see, it's easier to see their problem than our problem. And so what Jesus says to them has really profound implications for us. So let's keep moving. Verse 7. Here's what Jesus says to these um, fools. He says to them, if you had known what this means. So um, he says, guys, if you had just read your Bibles and listened, if you had just read your Bibles and understood what God was saying, here's what he quotes. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus is quoting some words that originally came from the prophet Hosea. There were other places that prophets said similar things. This is a direct quote from Hosea. What happened to God's people over and over and over again is that they became convinced that what God wanted from them was action. Okay, I got to do these religious things. I got to do these things. And so when they were confronted with the coldness of their hearts, they would always go to religious action. Well, look, God, look at all the things that I did for you. And Jesus is saying to these self-righteous men, 
If you had just understood what Hosea meant, worded from God, I don't desire your religious activity. I desire mercy or love. You would understand. See, all along, what is so clear is that what God wants from us is a response to his love to us. So we discover how much he loves us and we love him back. We discover God's love for us and so we love other people. Jesus would say the same to his disciples. This is actually the mark of a follower of mine. You love each other. You love other people because you've experienced God's love through me. And in this passage, he says, I, the son of man, am Lord of the Sabbath. Like it's going down through me. Like it's coming through me. He was preaching to them the gospel. What is the gospel? God sending his son who would live perfectly. So follow all the rules, the laws, the design of God as originally intended and commanded. Perfectly. None of us could do that. None of us could finish a life having perfectly followed the laws. Jesus did that. Having completed perfection for us, he then willingly went to the cross and reached out his arms. He was crucified and God the Father poured out the wrath due to us because of our sins on Jesus. He became our sin for us. He took the judgment of God for us. He stood in our place. And on Sunday, he proved that he pulled it off payment in full. Jesus overcame sin and death for us. Jesus said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Like, you want to have peace with God? Me? You want to feel rest like where you lay your head on your pillow at night? And there's peace? Me. You want to get to the end of your life and be ready to stand before God? Me. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus is asking us the question. He's giving us an invitation. Are you resting in Jesus? We talk about this a lot. To rest in Jesus means to believe with your heart that God did exactly that for you. That he sent his son to live perfectly, die sacrificially, and be raised victoriously. Like it is to believe Jesus is not just savior of the world, but he's savior of yours. And it is to confess with your mouth, like to act on it. Submitting your life to the lordship of Jesus. Of saying, Jesus, what you did for me, I respond by following you. You are Lord of my life. It is that simple. And yet it is absolutely life transforming to rest in Jesus. And be careful. When you hear that invitation to rest in Jesus, don't make a similar mistake that we talked about earlier by saying, oh, I did that when I was a kid. Yeah, if I rested in Jesus, so when the end of life comes, I'll be ready. Jesus was inviting them, inviting us to carry his yoke, to walk with him and experience life that is filled with rest that starts here, and it goes into eternity. Don't say, I'll do that one day, or I did it, and it'll pay off one day. To rest in Jesus is a present tense reality. Are you resting in Jesus? And when we understand resting in Jesus, and the fact that he is Lord of the Sabbath, we discover that number four out of ten, commandment number four from the Ten Commandments, is a gift from God for us. So straight out of Exodus 20, we are instructed, remember the Sabbath. You see, some of us have it posted in our houses or in our yards. But we don't follow number four. We've acted as if it's no big deal to break that one. Like God really doesn't care. Actually, when we look at number four, we see something really, really special. God established this commandment before the law. Like we see it in Genesis 1. Six days God created, 
And on the seventh day, he, he rested. From the very beginning, he created our world. He designed us, made in the image of God, to need, to enjoy, to be refreshed with a seventh day of rest. It was not just for God's people in the promised land. It was not given just to people who are still in sin and looking for a way out. It is given to God's people for all times as a gift. God has given you the gift of Sabbath, but most of us are breaking it. Not in the way the Pharisees were describing, not the rules around the rule, the rules around the gift, but man, we don't know how to rest. All we know how to do is save time and get distracted. So what does it mean to remember the Sabbath? The first description is keep it holy. Holy means unique, distinct, apart from, separate. Whatever you do on your day of rest, it should look different than the other days. So whatever a normal day is for you, Much of what's done on those days shouldn't be done on your day of rest. Like, take a break from those things. Now, some of you are already scheming. Like, I can already feel it in the room. Because some of the men here today are like, this is beautiful timing. This is like week three of NFL. And when my wife comes to me and says, are you going to sit there all day? Preacher told me to. (laughs) This is my day of rest. Some of you students have not gotten your homework done over the weekend. And uh, mom is going to call. Mom is going to come to your room. And she's going to say, did you get your homework done? And you're already ready. Michael said, I can't do work today. Didn't you listen? Homework. Mm -mm, Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It's my Sabbath. Now, remember... We, we as Americans are really good at saving time. We as Americans are really good about being selfish and distracted too. So the second part is equally important. To the Lord. Whatever you do on your Sabbath, it should refresh you, meaning you're ceasing the normal activity, and it gives life to you. Like it stirs in you the affections that you have for God. It's not just a a distraction. It's not a binge season three. Like it's what brings life to me. I mean, that's what it's about. That's what it looks like to have a Sabbath. The Pharisees missed it. We've been missing it. Let Let me tell you how bad I've missed it. I'm, I'm in that category of verse five. I'm in the semi-equivalent of a priest back in their day. Like, I help people get right with God. So, uh, Sunday, um, which is our typical Sabbath, because when Jesus was resurrected on, the sun, on Sunday, um, everything shifted for us. And so we began to approach God on a day of worship, also remembering the resurrection of Jesus. And so on the day that everybody else is remembering the resurrection of Jesus, the day that would be a natural Sabbath, like, this is my big day. Like, this is a day I got to be on point, not taking a nap in a hammock. Hannock or a hammock? One or the two, you know, whichever country you're from, but a hammock. A handy hammock? I'll try, I'll try to get myself out of that. Um, like, this is my day. And so, for years, like, I've been sinfully disobedient about a Sabbath. It's interesting, because I think about my dad. And I'm a typical son, like, I could more quickly make you a list of the things my dad did wrong than the things he did well. I'm a typical son. And yet, I do now see, especially the older I get, more of what my dad did right. And one thing he did with excellence was the Sabbath. My dad was a teacher by trade, um, a high school teacher, but his passion was farming. So he would work as a teacher all day, and we would farm all night, almost literally. But on Saturday at midnight, like it went funk, we stopped. And Sunday was go to church, 
fall asleep watching sports, probably play some sports in the yard, and go back to church. And it wasn't until like evening that, hey, as a teacher, he'd grade some papers and get ready for the next day. And I've, I've come to realize that um, I've been sinfully disobedient in that way. And just like the Pharisees, was kind of self-righteous about it. I'm a hard worker. Used to be, till we made our recent schedule shift to have Friday night services, that Friday was my day off. But I was so sinfully disobedient about Sabbath day rest that I would work on my day off too. And Carol Ann knew that I love what I do, and she would say, you know, I, I know you're going to think about work on your day off, but please don't call people on your day off. Like, please don't contact. I was so sinfully disobedient, I snuck texts. I wrote emails. I made calls when I knew she wouldn't see them. What a sicko. I'm hiding conversations from my wife, and I would get kind of self-righteous when she'd get totally ticked at me. And so now we've, we've made a significant shift to where Saturday, uh, even though I haven't done this well for years, like I get to spend with my family because Friday night's over and Sunday will be the next day. And so I'm kind of available, sort of, but like I'm going to be with my family and unapologetically present with them. And then actually tomorrow, Monday, is going to be my Sabbath. So good luck getting a hold of me. But I want that for you too. Like, you you got to shut it off. Do you, do you realize that one of the things that most plagues us is the inability to shut the flipping thing off? Like do you realize that we're addicted to that stupid screen? Like, we never shut off. We're always available. Andy Crouch made a really big challenge to us. One hour a day, one day a week one week a year. Shut it off. What if you actually had a meal present with your family? Like moms and dads, you are so disgusted by how your kids won't put down the phone. But there are times that they want to talk to you where you're looking at your phone. I know. I know. One day a week. What if you actually shut the thing off for a day? You will have withdrawal. Like no kidding. Withdrawal. Like Pastor Zach was going through the drive through to get a quick meal the other day, and he's, he found himself like anxious. And he realized, oh dang, it's because my phone's broken and I don't have it with me. I don't have anything to do while I wait on fast food. <laughs> His phone was broken for like three days, and by the end of the third day, people were actually mad at him for not responding to their texts and calls. That's how crazy it is for us. Little eyes are watching you. What message are you sending? Then what if there was actually a week a year we just disconnected? You've got to figure out, like, what, what, is, what does that day look like for you? Maybe like a Jewish person, it's sundown to sunset. I, it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to legally do a 12.01 a.m. to midnight. You you don't have to do it that way. When is the time that you are refreshed and your affections are stirred? No wonder I've had dry seasons. No wonder I have not felt refreshed. And make sure that you are shutting the things off that distract you. You are not that important. I'm not. And you don't need to make us think you're important by us being impressed by how busy you are. We should feel sorry for you. And we should recognize it in ourselves. Jesus said, come to me. I will give you rest for your souls. Are you ready to trust him with what it takes to rest? Let me pray for us. God, we do thank you 
for the beautiful opportunity that we have to come and be inspired by a big crowd and sense the joy of hundreds of people gathering together to worship you. And Lord, I thank you for telling us the truth, for helping us see in some other people's errors our own mistakes, the ways in which we are missing out on what you died to make available for us, how we're putting it off, how we're distracted, how we've turned it into self-righteousness instead of celebrating our righteousness that comes through Jesus. God, may you set us free. Um, (laughs) In a real clinical way, there are some of us who are addicted to the stupid ding. And when it doesn't ding, we go pick up our phone and check it again. God, may we find our identity, our rest, our hope solidly in you through Jesus, not what we think other people think of us because of what they like, share, post. God, set us free from anything and everything that takes us away from discovering the peace and rest that Jesus secured for us. We approach you with much hope because we are worn out, burned out, and wonder why. God, today we cling to you. We come to you longing to take a yoke that will relieve the burden that we have placed upon ourselves. Set your children free, I pray this day, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.